This episode is brought to you by Lightstream. We thank them for making our show a possibility. Yes, we do. Lightstream is the nation's premier online consumer lender. They offer low interest fixed rate loans from $5,000 to $100,000 for practically any purpose. I am a lesbian. Black, queer, human being. We are two gay dads. I am a transgender man. Trans woman. Bisexual, non-binary, single parent by choice. Can I ever have nice things? I just want <laughs> nice things. <laughs> he just got spit up on. <laughs> hey, ooh. Ooh, it's Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Can that be the extent of it? Because <laughs> Halloween don't make much sense to me. I don't care about it. I like pumpkin pie, but you know. Pumpkin pie is Thanksgiving. <laughs> but it's a pumpkin that you use from Halloween. Oh. That's why they had pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. Is that really because- it? I don't know. I might be making that oh, shit up. I don't know. Up. Somebody somebody Google that for us. But I mean, it sounds good. <laughs> but doesn't the pumpkin go bad? I guess you put it out in the snow back in the old days. And it was frozen. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Anyway, we were like, let's just let's just do a quick Halloween because neither one of us is big Halloween and we have to do the costumes for the yeah, kids. Yeah, didn't we just do it? Yeah, we did it. But I'm like, didn't we just but do now it? I'm just talking about how we said we we're going to do it fast and then we got off track. So anyway, okay, because we have some fun okay. stuff to talk about. <laughs> we hope you all have a wonderful and safe Halloween. But also, we've been asking you all in these intros to write in with your stories. And you are. We've had some asks lately. Folks have written in and asking us. They want more stories about LGBTQ family building. Why are you laughing at me? Because I'm not making sense. Around the world. All around the world. And what it's like <laughs> talking to older kids about their donor. Can I read this first one? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we got some people to write in about those two okay. experiences. So Joanna wrote in. I think it's Johanna. Johanna. Maybe Johanna? it's Johanna. Jo- you tell us. Johanna wrote in. I live in Norway. And although it's not perfect, there is both government subsidized IVF and private IVF. And both parents get legal recognition from the start. Ashe, you can also Norway. do Ashe. Ashe, You can also do our IVF, which is reciprocal IVF subsidized. Dang, go but, ahead, Norway. But and there is a big ass but, mm-hmm. no pun. You cannot choose your donor. Only suggest three, and the doctor decides. Now hold okay. up the phone, Joanna. One second. What in the Mary? That gay is, dance and lords a leaping hell is this there, you know what we talk to people some people don't seem to they don't they don't make such a big deal about their donor they're not as neurotic about that as i was about my donor but i don't know man i'm not letting some doctor decide my donor i don't know how do y'all right, feel how, about how do that? we know it's not him uh yeah right <laughs> exactly because i saw that movie on netflix with the donor who like Instead of using the oh, donation yeah, yeah, semen, those... I probably shouldn't even talk about it. But it, hey, it happens. Well, who knows? I don't know. I, but it sounds like, listen, Norway is like ahead of us in so many ways. But that's the thing. Yeah. Like, it's no, it's not perfect anywhere. It's not perfect nowhere anywhere. Nowhere is perfect. Well, you know what? We're wishing you all the best of luck in your journey and wherever you are in it, Johanna. And then Carolyn sent us this awesome story. Oh, I love this This has ahead, to Jay. do with talking to your older kids about donors and, and uh, origin stories. So, so she writes in, she goes, their daughters were born via anonymous sperm donor in 2004 and 2008, so a while ago. And by the time their oldest daughter, Annie, was in fifth grade, she says she knew the talk, in quotations, was coming from health class. And she wanted to get ahead of the presumed heteronormative talk about the babies and tell Annie how she was made. So, so they were like nervous. They sent the younger daughter away and they had quiet time and they explained there was a nice man who gave them a donation of his DNA and compared it, like kind of compared it to the process of blood donation. And we showed her the full 12 page portfolio of the donor. And when they were finished explaining it all, (laughs) she patted us, (laughs) wait for it. She patted us both on the back and said, you guys must have been really nervous to tell me about this, but she did a really good job. That's one. That's (laughs) I love kids. They're especially these new generation kids because they don't. They're their like, oldest daughter is eighteen plus. F- wait, is eighteen? 20, 2004 minus two thousand eighteen. Right, she's, that's eighteen. She's in the college right now, I think, and like it's oh amazing. But then she came down the next day and she was like, "You know what? I've been thinking about it." Um, and you know, it was really nice of him to donate his DNA. That's so cute. And then cut to three years later with their other daughter. They're watching TV together, and the other daughter goes. <laughs> 
She asks <laughs> if she's related to the guy hosting the TV on the show on TV. And then she was like, ah, we never even talked to her about this. And she was like, it was so awkward. And then and then the daughter goes, are Annie and I made from the same man juice? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Like it all turns kids, out, they, no. they they had a wonderful conversation. The kids are like so awesome and lovely. And she she goes on to say that over the years, they they have asked the daughters like, "Do you want more to know more?" She did Google him. Like she went down a Google search the the mom oh, wow. and found him. And then she was like, "That was weird." He still doesn't know who we are, but I kind of know who he is, and that was weird. She was like, "But we've wow. we've kept it open to that. Like, if you do, do you want to know no more? Do you want to know more?" And their daughters just happen to be the the kids that are like, "Nah." Not interested. Like, you just never know, you know? And so... You never know. But they keep the door open. So anyway, that's some fun. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Carolyn, thank you Mm -hmm. for sending that. That did everything that I needed it to do on this rainy Monday. That may not be Monday when this airs. We love your stories. Please keep them coming. Yes. More the merrier. Absolutely. And moving right along. So we have a Patreon member that we have to thank because I messed up last week and I didn't include one of the names. Oh, no. So Jay. I know. Claudie Marengo Liad, <laughs> who is, I'm assuming, mm. the spouse to Michelle Marengo Liad, uh, who we mentioned oh, last yes. week. But I didn't notice there were two names there. <laughs> so wow. Claudie. We'll get it. Claudie, thank you so much for being a part of our Patreon community. It means the world and Michelle and all you others. And, you know, if you happen to be in a lucky position to have a little extra cash hanging around, consider joining our Patreon community. Right, E? Absolutely. We've got various tiers in our Patreon community starting at just two bucks a two month. Bucks. Come on, guys. Two bucks less a month. It's less a than a cup of, of coffee. <laughs> oh, girl. So you'll do a good thing and get bonus content like videos of most episodes dropped a day early, crazy behind the scenes shenanigans of Jay and I trying to get our lives together Ryan. and anything else we can mm, <laughs> and anything else we can think to post to keep you all entertained and engaged. Woo-hoo. All right. And yeah. if the bonus perks we offer don't appeal to you, please let us know. and We'll do our best to bring you the special things you want. Maybe if you give us your money. Nope. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> All right, let's talk about let's talk about Michael Harbour. Michael, what a journey! Mm. We're we're talking um, surrogacy journey here, and as is usually the case with surrogacy journeys, they had some serious ups and downs and bumps. It's a it's a roller coaster. It's a roller. Coaster. It is a roller coaster. And Michael is also an HIV and AIDS health physician, mm-hmm. and was on the front line of the AIDS epidemic back in the nineties. And he talks about how scary, well, I remember how scary it was for our community and the world, but also he compared it to the pandemic we find ourselves in now Mm -hmm. and the ongoing struggles our community faces in regards to HIV and AIDS and so many other things that Mm -hmm. we've come a long way, baby, but we've got a long way to go. It's nice that we have Michael in our court there, but... um, also, we just have to let you know, we got some noise interruptions that we couldn't avoid in this interview because Michael was at home. You got to love that Zoom life. We're all in it. And of course, like in the middle of the interview, his landscaper gardener person just needed to like mow a lawn or chop down a tree right outside his window. I don't know what it was, but it was loud. <laughs> I love that he was chopping a tree <laughs> I don't know, down. I made Your that landscaper up. comes over and I'm just going to chop I'm a just tree just down made that right up. now. I don't know what he was doing. But, you know, you might hear it a bit. And apologies in advance. You're still going to get a Can I give a, a shout out yeah. to our, our sound editor, Maria Ooh. and Steph? Ugh. The because best. sometimes we bring them, we bring them Ooh. a heap of pile of recorded <laughs> mess. We sure do. And they sort that shit out. So shout out, Maria. Boop, 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 Maria. boo. Steph. Boop, 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 boo. We love y'all. Thank and you. all the team at Edit Audio. You're our saviors for reals. Mm. And with that, I mean, I think, I think we've said enough. We're going to nicely <laughs> ask Helen and Beulah, who are Jamie, sitting. Jamie, you got to cut it. <laughs> you got to cut it. I know, it. Helen, Helen. I know. Who, All right, wrap it up, wrap okay. it up. I need my cigarette. Okay, Helen. They were sitting so quietly and like lovebirds on the couch until this moment. So we're... <laughs> oh, t- <laughs> it's that Beulah? It's me, Beulah. Oh, my it's God. It's me, Beulah. Yes, oh. Lord Jesus. Ladies, roll, roll the tape. All right, we're going to roll it. Hi, Michael. Good morning. Hi. Is it morning? Yes, it is. Where, is, where I am. <laughs> yes. We've had some technical issues since getting on here, and we talk about this with the listeners all the time. Um, Michael's kids were still in the house. We had to get the kids out, and now we just started recording, and my buzzer is ringing. I can't even with this. Like, this is the virtual world we live in. It will stop. Yeah, it will and stop. The, 
<laughs> and the gardening team just showed up and they're buzzing and blowing <laughs> outside. So um, there will be you some You can't noise. make this up. This is real life, folks. So without further ado, Michael, I think we need to just get right into your elevator pitch. So you're going to give us a 30 second elevator pitch of who you are and why you are here talking to these ovaries right here today. Okay. And I, I start <laughs> the right. timer. However, we never care, really. It's more for fun and shit. We're never going to We're never going to cut you yeah. off if you go over. We are not. All right. Well, I'm Michael Harbour. I'm a, a medical physician and an expert in public health. Um, I'm a gay man and uh, and married to my uh, husband, and we have two kids, and I'm delighted here to talk to you about my journey of how I uh, became a, a father. Love it. Oh, that, that was, was great. Spoken like a true professional. That was very succinct and to the point. I like it very much. Boom. Nice work. All right, so, Michael, you... Um, are married. Can you take us back to like the very beginning of you and your husband? Or or before that, have you always been out? No, that's a really, that's an interesting question. No, I have not. You know, there, there's two aspects that I think about uh, my, my journey as, as a physician. Um, one, in working in a, uh, a medical environment where there's a lot of scrutiny on on the person you know how that person acts and performs and so you automatically think in the medical uh, field and residency training medical school training that you're being judged mm-hmm. and so coming out as a as a medical student and and resident made me very nervous for fear that maybe I would be prejudged and receive lesser grades um, mm. lesser opportunities to uh, move up go to great residency programs and so that was was something that made me um, nervous, to tell you the truth. And um, there's there's a lot of people that have to uh, subjectively evaluate you in the medical field. And so that was something that was was difficult. And that was what what years about were this? Well, I graduated in 1992. And so that was a, that was a minute ago. Do you think it's different now? That whole mm. the, the oh, pressure. Oh, absolutely. It, things have absolutely. changed, correct? A bit. Things have changed, and there has been much more um, recognition of, of diversity and inclusion, not only in um, how we take care of patients, but among one another in our environments mm-hmm. that we train in as well. So that has made things um, much different. But the other thing that I was going to mention is, you know, I just had my own internal homophobia that was, you know, uh, layered on top of the external scrutiny. And that exacerbated the, you know, the issues uh, as well. So that took time for me to address um, through the years as well. Got it, yeah. So when they all came together, then, you know, then I'm more in harmony, right? Yeah. Right. When do you make the decision to, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to own it? Well, so I was very lucky in that, and whether this was fate or whether I self-guided myself, but the first role that I took after I finished my training was that actually the nation's preeminent gay and lesbian health center, which is a Fenway Community Health Center in, in Boston. I've been there. Yeah, it's a great place. I it's used to well go known. there because I went to school in Boston and it was around the corner. Yep. So I took a position there and a junior faculty position at Harvard Medical School and um, at the beginning or the early days of the AIDS epidemic. And so uh, there was a lot of LGBT general health, but also uh, um, HIV care that, that we did. While I was in Boston, I was actually also the city of Boston's um, hospice AIDS director for the city. So I ran the entire uh, hospice program for them. Mm. So it was a busy time. It was a sad time. Mm. We had several patients die every day in in hospice. And um, while I was there in hospice, uh, you know, as the medical director was when the new medications, the protease inhibitors came out. So halfway through my uh, tenure as medical director, these drugs came out and all of a sudden we saw a, a major change in the number of people that were coming into the hosp- hospice and we were able to actually discharge some patients from hospice. They came in thinking that they were going to die. We were able to get them the medications while they were there oh my God. and then they were able to uh, actually walk out of hospice with a new lease on life. Oh my it was God. Can I just say dramatic. thank you so much. I lost my dad to um, complications of HIV and I've always thought of the healthcare workers who I'm a cr- I'm not gonna cry. Who stay and work through it, and I'm so grateful. We've seen a lot more attention on that because of the pandemic. Thank you 
for staying and going through it with our people. When I say our people, I mean the human race. We're all in the same race, right? Thank you for going through it because it must not have been easy, I'm sure. It, it wasn't. We worked seven days a week in those days. Um, you know, it was a difficult time, but, you know, thank you for your recognition. What I've lived through the past three years of the COVID epidemic is very reminiscent mm. of that time. Mm. I like that you make that parallel. And I feel like because we've come so far with HIV and AIDS research and meds, kids today don't really realize how awful and scary that pandemic was, especially yeah. Yeah. for the LGBTQ plus community. Yes. Um, and how it, it, ostracizing it personally it shook was. me to the bone, right? Right. I, it was my professional career, but it was also my own personal phobia. Mm. And trying to deal with both was very difficult. Were you out at this point or were you still kind of? Well, when I, so when I took my job at Fenway, which was an ostensibly gay medical mm -hmm. center, um, it actually allowed me to work with a majority of people who were gay. And when yes. I would go into the hospital, um, they always recognized us physicians as the ones taking care of the HIV patients as, oh, they're, they're the ones that come from the Gay and Lesbian Health Center. They're the experts in, in this disease. And so all of a sudden I was being recognized with some types of skills that was almost heroic. And, and I, I felt better about myself and it allowed me to, to come to terms with that, um, that side of me. So. Mm. But I can remember going to interview there. I wonder who's going to see me walk into this place because <laughs> I was going to be outed right. by just walking through the place. Yeah. And when I finally left those doors to come to California, there was no turning back. I mean, I just realized, oh, I never want to go back into the closet. I don't ever want to be somebody who I'm not or pretend not to be. It's funny you say that. And you made me think about like when I started this podcast, I was out. I was out and proud and out but mm -hmm. like i didn't think about the fact that this was going to be all over my social media i didn't think this was going to get as big as it has and like high school friends from home elementary school friends from home were going to learn that not only mm -hmm. is jamie a real flaming lesbian with kids she's got a freaking podcast about it now and like yeah. and i've had moments where i'm like oh shit that was not the plan i wasn't yeah. thinking about that but yeah. it, it's freeing. It, it is. It is absolutely it's liberating. Freeing. And then when you're comfortable in your own skin, the people around you respond mm. to you differently. When you are natural with it, they can be natural with mm -hmm. it. And so that process of coming out and feeling good about yourself changes your relationships with others around you for the better. True. Absolutely. I, I like to think of it as when I shine my light, that gives others permission to shine their light. So mm -hmm. it's important that we shine our light and we stay authentic. I want to hear the love story. That's what I want to yeah. hear. When do you and how do you and your husband meet? What's okay. the moment that you lock so, eyes and you know that this is the one? Like when did that happen? My husband and I met met on a blind date through a, a you know kind of a dating introduction site at the time it was called Gay dot com. Oh. And you know those were the days of AOL where you'd have to kind of dial into the server and you know hear all that funny. <laughs> Um, downloading stuff, and then you, then you would meet somebody. But uh, my husband is from Spain, from Madrid, had come to the United States to go to college and Stanford for graduate school. I was working at Stanford as a junior faculty member. And um, we met at a coffee shop in Palo Alto, and, and it kind of went from there. And we dated a number of years before, uh, before we got married, and we actually got married August 1st, 2015, oh. so seven Ooh. years ago. Congrats. And how long were you dating before that? Oh, a number of years. A while, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there was no U-hauling. There was no U-hauling. It was um, a process. There's different cultural aspects from our, um, from our families and different acceptances. We had a fabulous wedding and the family came from Spain. They surprised us. They ended up embracing our, 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 our marriage and we were married at a, a, a beautiful winery in Northern California with great food and wine. And what I always wanted was a, a share impersonator to come to my wedding. And boy, we got the best share impersonator. And of course, all the Spanish people thought she was share. And so she danced and sang and had a great time with everybody. And uh, it, was a, it was an amazing wedding. Oh my God, that's amazing. Was she drag? Yeah, she was drag. Yeah. <laughs> 
That sounds like fun. <laughs> That's amazing. Sheesh. It's hard to make those babies in our families, huh? Especially, especially, E, when you don't have a uterus of your own. Right? Right? Mm-hmm. And expensive. Mm-hmm. We put so much money into these journeys. We really do. They can be really expensive journeys. That's why we always say start planning early. Start saving. Get your money in order. Truth. Get your ducks in a row. Yeah. Facts. Facts. <laughs> hashtag facts. Hashtag truth. Mm. But if you're thinking about and or ready for this baby making, family making chapter in your life, we have a way to help you get rid of any high interest credit card debt you might have. So you can start this journey with a clean slate, as it were. Yes. Yes. A lot of us have credit card debt. Let's be real. And now might be uh, the time to consolidate your debt and pay it off faster with a low fixed rate loan from Lightstream. A credit card consolidation from Lightstream can help you pay off your credit cards and lock in a low fixed interest rate. Rates start at 6.99% APR with auto pay and excellent credit. You can even get your money as soon as the day you apply, y'all. Plus, the rate is fixed, so it will never go up over the life of the loan. And just for our listeners, apply now to get a special interest rate discount and save even more. Yes, the only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash O-C-T. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com forward slash O-C-T. Disclaimer, subject to credit approval, rates range from 6.99% APR to 19.99% APR and include a 0.5% auto pay discount. Lowest rate requires excellent credit. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com forward slash OCT for more information. So you get married and then when do when do babies come into the picture? What's the conversation surrounding having kids? Prior to us getting married was when um, we started looking at uh, surrogacy options and uh, surrogacy planning. Mm -hmm. As you know, it's a long process Mm -hmm. and it is more complicated biologically for for men to do this Mm -hmm. um, than it is for women. And um, basically a woman already has the the egg that can be fertilized and it's a lot easier to get a semen sample and sperm sample to fertilize that egg than than when you're missing the egg. And the uterus that helps, um, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. So take us through. So you decided you wanted to choose the surrogacy route. In our process, we we tried to gather as much information as we could. And one of the ways that we did that was we attended a meeting called um, Men Having Babies. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of um, an informational uh, uh, meeting that takes place in different cities across the United States where different experts and vendors come and it's kind of an all in one shop you know shopping experience to to get as much information as you can i also did as much reading as i could and then we decided to go ahead with a surrogacy agency the egg donation and the identification of an egg donor usually happens much faster than than finding a surrogate. Mm -hmm. In our process we actually found the surrogate first interesting um it just so happened that this woman was available. We had a number of teleconferences with her. We met her in person. We actually signed a contract through the agency. And then you begin paying that person a, a fee to kind of stay on your team until such time the egg is ready for implementation. And in our case, we had chosen an egg donor, but she wasn't going to be available for a number of months because she had already contracted to have, be an egg donor for mm. somebody else. Ah. Well, that, that, period of time actually got delayed and delayed and delayed and all of a sudden a full year went by we were waiting for this egg donor and we kept being told oh just one more month one more month because because when you find that donor when you find the right one you want to yeah. stick with it you know you're, you're, you're like to suck okay set on it this yeah. is the one this is the one you know and it doesn't always work yes. out that way right so we ended up having more expenses because we paid the the surrogate probably years worth of compensation just to wait around for us because she could have gone to somebody else. And then um, we got the, the egg retrieval. And then right before the transfer, the surrogate changed her mind. Oh no. And said, I don't, I don't want to do this any longer. (gasps) And we had to start that 
finding a surrogate all over so again. So you had so she, the embryos yeah. on ice. The embryos are yeah, on ice. The embryos ice. were frozen. Um, I'm going to be producer one moment. There's like a um, like a whistle sound happening. That is our landscaper outside. Oh, okay, well, yeah. listeners, bear with us. This is the COVID life. Um, yeah. Okay, so I want to take it back before we move forward with you going and finding the new surrogate and stuff. How did you decide which one of you would carry the DNA for the embryos? So, we actually decided that we would both do that. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, eggs were obtained, and each one of us had been independently evaluated by the um, reproductive uh, endocrinologist specialist. And um, we had blood and genetic testing done, semen analysis were done, and they were compatible with the genetics of the donated egg. And when I say donated, it wasn't donated. It was no. paid for, right? Right, right exactly. <laughs> and so we both... Uh, independently fertilized a portion of those uh, Mm -hmm. of the retrieved eggs. So we have uh, some embryos from each one of us. And so you haven't had to make the decision yet whose egg goes in yet because you have to find a surrogate. You can put them both in too. So we we found another surrogate and that took a while. And there were several attempts at finding a surrogate. We actually found somebody, but then for some reason it wasn't communicated to the surrogate that we were a gay couple and once she found that out she didn't want to be a surrogate for a gay couple and that was surprising because i was working with a a company that specialized in lgbt folks i'm thinking how could that have been overlooked so when these types of mistakes were done that's when i said enough with this surrogacy company i'm going to find somebody else Wow. I, I ended up having to transfer surrogacy co- companies. That's pay heartbreaking. Pay a whole new initiation fee to somebody. This is and two surrogates now. So far, we're at two. And then we um, finally found another surrogate who was suitable, worked with us. She was in our state. We were very happy with her. And we decided to start with my um, my husband's embryos. We try not to think of them as his and mine it's just ours and 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 which one we're going to right. start with you know Agreed. that's how we looked yeah i only ask that because this is one of the main this is one of the big big decisions Absolutely. that our sure. families face and so it's we really try to talk about that decision making process on the show for for other lgbtq folks who are going right. through it and how are we going to make this how do we do this and everybody has their own way of getting to the decisions they make and yeah, so jamie and e it's interesting how so many people want to know who's the father. Oh, you know? yeah. I mean, that's one of the Agreed. questions that come Agreed. up all the time, you know. And I'm always still so surprised when these moments come up and the agency knew that you were LGBTQ and the surrogate says no. I'm still surprised at the homophobia that lives yeah. in our society because my life is so queer, right? It's so queer friendly. I live on yeah. the East Coast. Like, I just assume so many things based on where right. I live. And that's not the case everywhere. No, it's not. And laws governing surrogacy are different in many states in the United States. And so your surrogate needs to come from a state whose laws are compatible with surrogacy, that you can actually uh, deliver a baby and that baby can be, um, you know, handed over to the uh the intended parents, and hopefully, and and legally, that process is seamless. But not all states allow for that. There are some states that actually will pre pre sign all this paperwork. So the moment that baby's born, you don't need to go to a judge and and do an adoption. You know, it's already done ahead of time. California is one of those states. Um, Pennsylvania is one of those states. Many states are. But um, and so it it really takes a village to do this whole surrogacy thing. And the level of expense has been tripping me out because I think to get our son, we spent maybe sixty to $70,000 total trying yeah. for two years. However, with surrogacy yeah. for what I'm learning, because we've had a couple of other guests on who have gone through this as fathers, but it's ninety dollars to $150,000 sometimes a try. Yeah. That yeah. blew yeah. me away. And how do you do it if you don't have that? You know, yeah. If you don't have the resources, it's it's very difficult. But I'll, I'll tell you what happened for us. So we found we finally found that surrogate. We had the transfer procedure. The embryo 
didn't take the first time. She was what we thought maybe pregnant for a fleeting few days. Mm -hmm. uh, the blood work showed that she had an elevated uh, LSH, ADHG, whatever. which the, yeah, that yeah. that didn't pan out, and and so then we went through a, a, a second transfer, and this is again several months later because mm -hmm. you know you can't do this just month after month, and so um, we put in a single embryo, and uh, she became pregnant, and then as blood work was checked. The, the blood levels were going up so dramatically mm -hmm. that the doctor said, hey, this could be twins, mm -hmm. even though there was only one egg put in, right? And cool. so then when she went for an ultrasound, sure enough, that single embryo on its own um, split, and we had identical twin boys developing. Oh, my goodness. And so we were over the moon. And how exciting is that? So things were going great with this pregnancy, and into the second trimester, um, our surrogate you know, went for her appointments and, and one appointment she showed up and the doctor said, I'm sorry, but both babies have died oh, and, um, oh my God. and we're going to have to remove them through, oh my God. Uh, you know, an extraction. I'm so sorry. That's and that was, that was very absolutely. traumatic oh. for, for everyone, especially the surrogate. Yeah. Yeah. Because once she was told that, and then it took, you know, a day or so to schedule that, can you imagine thinking that you have two dead fetuses inside of you. Everybody's heart broke. Oh, Everybody's right. heart broke. And um, it was very hard on my husband. I, Being a medical professional, I think I could understand that um, biologically what happened. Um, it was so emotionally hard. We had to then find another surrogate, which took that whole process all over again. So here we are back, at, you know, two years into this or more. Mm -hmm. And we're back to where we started mm. with nothing. Mm. <laughs> and but you so, still had some embryos. Oh, yes. We still had okay. some embryos. Um, but my husband's embryos had been depleted mm. um, because we had had several transfers. And, and obviously not all of them, you know, become viable after the fertilization. So we did end up going back to that original egg donor, having another procedure. Wow. And made more embryos. Wow. Okay. And so there was an additional expense. Go ahead you with know, your bad self, egg donor. Yeah. Way to show and, up. <laughs> yeah. Um, then when we finally found that new surrogate, we tried then with my embryo and it took on the first time. And uh, we, you know, delivered a, a baby boy um, nine months later. Okay. Congratulations. congratulations. Yay. We, yeah. we got, we got one. one. Yay. Yeah, we got one. <laughs> Very healthy, very healthy baby boy, wonderful baby. Oh. And then we decided to, to, to do it again. And we found a, another surrogate, this one in Pennsylvania. And so this is a, a surrogate way across the country. You know, that was very interesting to, to do that. She had to actually fly out to California to be examined by our IVF doctor in San Diego. And um, after she passed all of that, physical exam and evaluation. Um, she had to come back again a second time for the, the embryo transfer. So again, you're playing for flights, you're paying for hotels, you're playing for Can multiple I just doctor's say, visits. This yeah. is the time where that pay differential between males and females feels like it balances <laughs> out a little bit because the expense is astronomical. Yeah. It's just, I can't even imagine. For two children, we're probably at three hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars. I, you know, I, I never added it up in the end to right. tell you the truth. You don't want um, to. I don't right. want to add mine up either. <laughs> well, we only did it because we had an interview once on CNN, and they yeah. the focus of the interview was the financial cost because our community yeah. needs to understand, and I hope everybody listening understands. Two children, males who are professional, these beautiful fathers who are professionals. That's a lot. $350,000 some people don't make in their lifetime. And I hope right. that we as a community start to really put focus on the people, whatever gender or expression they are, yeah. who cannot afford that. You know, right. And I guess the other thing to think about is that um, this is not reimbursable. Mm -hmm. This is not tax deductible. Mm -hmm. To be able to spend $350,000 means... That's after taxes. Yeah, and there's no insurance help. Nothing. No. Nothing. No, you have to. Oh, wait a minute. Well, wait a minute. Back, 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 back. So there's because we get as uh, uh, you know people with uteruses get insurance, certain coverage like IUIs sometimes. were covered sometimes. Yeah. 
It so you're saying with, insurance. with surrogacy and two dads, there's no help from insurance at all? No. Ooh. So what happens is most insurances, like for the surrogate, have that as an exclusion to their policy. They say, why should we pay mm -hmm. for a woman to have a baby that's not her own? Oh. Mm -hmm. Especially if she's being paid by a, an, you know, some intended parents. It's so they exclude so that. It's so inherently biased. biased. There needs to yeah. be such an overhaul yeah. for our families, but we're not there yet. But this, but you know, this is actually even goes beyond whether this is gay or lesbians wanting to do this. Let's just say that we take a, a, a heterosexual couple who is unable to have children for any particular reason, and they need to do that process as well <laughs> because that may seem more normal to an insurance agency you would think maybe they would cover that for uh for infertility whatnot but all these things are, are carved carved out these are kind of what insurance companies and many um employers think of as uh niceties or you know mm. this is what you want so you're gonna have to pay for that right, right. But um, what I did find out, I've had uh, two employers that actually did offer some assistance during this time. So one of my employers recognizes the the um, the cost of this. I, I've I've been with two different employers during the course of uh, these two surrogacy episodes, and one employer actually um, as a benefit or reimbursed us i think uh it was 20 or twenty five thousand dollars wow that's great against all the services so that was nice of course that was all taxable so i mean i in the end maybe i got fourteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars of actual discount off of that and one employer offered five thousand dollars again that was taxable so maybe i got twenty five hundred twenty eight hundred dollars back afterwards mm -hmm. but it's a um a recognition of that cost and that would be available to gay or straight employees. Right. And so now you've got your two. And how old are they now? So my son turned uh, three yesterday. Um, Happy birthday. And my daughter, Happy birthday. Thank you. And my daughter will be two in November. So you have little and babies. So, mm -hmm. Yes, I have little babies. I'm amazed yeah. you have this time right now. That's why you have a, a, a village. <laughs> yeah, it is a village. Yeah, yeah right It takes now a village to my... make the babies and it takes a... Village to raise the babies. I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a whole. If thing. not for my mother and sister, we would not have been okay in the beginning with my son. So, yeah. Oof, yeah. little babies. Well, I don't live next door to any family. My mom lives down in Southern California and has come up multiple times. So we have found a couple of great nannies, but uh, we've we've sheltered the kids from COVID. None of us have had of it, even though I work around uh, you know COVID patients regularly. Um, and uh, my little son just started school two weeks ago, preschool. And I, you know, I wonder about what what's going to happen. Will he will he be exposed? He's been vaccinated, but uh, you know, there's no guarantees for any of this, right? No, it's a scary time. It still is. is. Yeah. But I love hearing that you have your three year old who just turned three yesterday yeah. vaccinated. And I think it's important for our community to hear that. And yeah. understand that if you, a doctor of infectious diseases, is getting your baby, your precious baby that has your whole heart and getting yeah. uh, vaccinated, we can get our kids vaccinated against COVID. Absolutely. And all of my physician friends who are in the same business, and we all feel very strongly about that. Mm -hmm. Are you planning more family? Are you just with the two or do you want to, do you mind sharing that? Yeah, so we we um, have been open to a, a third child. We certainly have embryos available to us to to use. They're frozen, and you know, the longer we keep them frozen, there's a, a monthly service fee to you know do that. So there's an expense with that. We've talked to um, a, a surrogate, and um, and for six months we thought we'd go through it, and then the surrogate's life situation has just changed, and she decided not to to pursue this any any further so again you know these are human lives involved there, there's you know <laughs> you can't guarantee any contract with with anybody mm. and before we say goodbye i just want to talk about you now work at a a company that that does work with hiv and aids patients and is also yes, very yes. inclusive of lgbtq plus 
folks trying to make their families. Yeah, so I, I work for a pharmaceutical company. I work for a company that's called EMD Serono, and they have been in the HIV um, industry for over 25 years now. They make a product that helps patients who may develop HIV-associated wasting, and so uh, which is, you know, abnormal weight loss that can occur um, during uh, uh, an infection. And so um, they certainly have a, um, a finger on the, on the pulse here of, of what's going on in, in HIV medicine. I've been doing some research for them, publishing uh, work and uh, disseminating information about the disease state. And they're a progressive company that has been very supportive of me and my family's journey. And in fact, when I um, started the company, our surrogate was already pregnant. And so um, I let them know that, hey, I'm going to be having a child. And, you know, some women don't want to ever talk about the fact that they want to become pregnant or are pregnant when they get a job mm -hmm. for fear that maybe that will be a discrim mm -hmm. discriminatory um, thing against them. And I was up front with that and they welcomed that. And in fact, you know, they said, you take all the paternity time that we give anybody. And, and I had only been with the company literally two weeks before my baby was born. Mm. And they were wonderful uh, to me for that. And they gave me the full amount of paternity time. I didn't take it right away. You have a year to use it. And so my, my husband took his paternity time first. I wanted to get well established with the company and get my job settled. And then I was able to um, you know, take my paternity time. And people should certainly look at those types of benefits that mm -hmm. their employers may, may offer. And not everybody is aware of that. Like I had no idea that... Um, the company offered these things until I until I got there. So people should ask. And if mm -hmm. they don't have that, they can certainly ask their human resources department whether they can institute yep. these things. That's wonderful. Thank you Michael, so much. Michael, thank you for coming on and sharing about your journey and your wealth of knowledge. It's an amazing process making these babies and enjoying mm -hmm. them and then having them get on your nerves. So <laughs> <laughs> they sure do. Thank you so much, Michael, for coming in. Oh, well, well, thank you both for, for having me. Ah, oh, Michael, 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 Michael. What a, what a sweet I was going to say the same thing. Look at us. <laughs> Look, if you could have seen the mayhem before we started that interview, Michael, <laughs> Michael had a house full of folks that he was trying to get organized and out of the house. It was the, all the kids, the nannies, the husband. It was like the grandparents. It takes a village. It takes a village. It takes a village. It, there is never a dull moment when you're a parent. Never. And never. Um, that was fun to watch. But we yeah. got it together. And um, I'm so glad we were able to speak with Michael about all the wonderful things. And I'm so happy they got those babies. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. And that he does have the help that he does. Mm -hmm. And him and his husband are, you know, pressing on doing the good work yes. in the world and taking care of their home. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And their babies and their family. So that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you love this show, of course you do, right? How could you not love If These Ovaries Could Talk, the Queer Family podcast? And you want to represent your love for us and our beautiful families, you need to head to our shop and get some of this merch some of the if these ovaries could talk the queer family podcast merchandise mm -hmm. we got all kinds of mm -hmm. merch and this is the perfect time to get it because it's the what holidays. holidays you could be one of us for halloween why don't you switch your costume up right now get just it's a little late it's a little late so halloween's too late <laughs> so get the merch for um thanksgiving Equipment when you go when you season. go to your republican family's conservative house <laughs> just wear all of our merchandise <laughs> Go to the link in our bio on our Instagram page to get to the store. <laughs> also, y'all, don't forget to buy the awesome book, If These Ovaries Could Talk, that Jamie and her previous co-host, Robin Hopkins, created. You can get it wherever you buy books. It's chock full of stories, just like the one you heard in today's EP. That's short for episode because yes. I'm hip with the lingo. I mean, are you, though? It's broken up. <laughs> it's broken up into categories of themes that pop up for our families. Like the search for Superman, a.k.a. the donor search, which you probably don't have if you live in Norway. I mean, mm. I, listen. Yeah, um, the doctor just gives it to being you. Being out and about with your kids, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so you can, pick, um, you can pick up the topic you want, and then you can read in depth on that one topic. Then you put the book down and forget about it for a while, and then you pick it up again. But anyway, 
Listen, go to patreon.com slash ovaries talk to sign up and to get bonus content. Find us on social media. We're at ovaries talk on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the TikTok. And if these ovaries could talk on YouTube, and we, like I said last week, we are releasing archived episodes, the video episodes that have never been released before, uh-huh. except unless you have been on Patreon. So we're releasing them as these weeks go by. So check it out. See if there's anything you'd like to see, some people that you didn't see before. I don't know. Anyway. That's that. Yes. And thank you to our sponsor, Lightstream. Lightstream is the nation's premier online consumer lender. They offer low interest fixed rate loans from $5,000 to $100,000 for practically any purpose. And of course, that huge thank you to Patreon folks. We appreciate you. We love you. One more thing. A huge thank you to Deneen, who heard our call for help a few weeks ago on a recent episode and has been helping out with some of our social media designs. And has come up with some great stuff. Deneen, you're a freaking rock star. We'd be lost without you. You are the wind beneath our wings. You, I mean, what else can we say? You are the wind. I knew you were going to sing. I knew you were going to sing. That's it. We have to say goodbye. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Wait, what? Stick around for one second, everyone, because I forgot. The head of fertility and endocrinology of EMD Serono that Michael works at sent us a little voice memo to tell us all about the programs they have to help LGBTQ folks build our families and the resources they have there. If you want more than thus just this here podcast as a resource, they can give you that. So, so stick around. There's a little voice memo at the end from Libby Horn. All right, eggs, ovaries, ovaries. out. Oh. If these o- o- ovaries could talk, they would say eggs, ovaries out. I'm Libby Horn, head of the fertility and endocrinology business at EMD Serono a biopharmaceutical company whose purpose is to help create, improve, and prolong life for people living with difficult-to-treat conditions like infertility, multiple sclerosis, and cancer. And one area we're particularly proud of is our commitment to the LGBTQ plus community. Through partnerships with organizations like Men Having Babies, we've learned and optimized information sharing for those interested in starting a family. In fact, we were among the first companies to educate and offer resources for LGBTQ plus persons interested in starting a family. In addition, we organized speaker programs with doctors and intended parents to help educate the LGBTQ community on family building options. And we took things a step further by connecting with other companies, employee resource groups to educate on the benefit of building LGBTQ friendly family building options into their employee insurance plans. This is only the beginning for EMD Serono. With our history and commitment to patients, we'll continue to explore ways that we can best help those on their path to parenthood. Because at the end of the day, everyone deserves the opportunity to create a family. Check out our resources for the LGBTQ plus community on fertility.com. There's an entire section dedicated to educating LGBTQ plus persons on choices, the cost of treatment, and other aspects to consider in expanding your family.